It is my real pl pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Flowers, our keynote speaker. Uh, she is the PNHP Congressional Fellow in Washington, D.C. She's a tireless advocate for health care for all. Uh, on, the front, on the front lines of activism, I don't know how many miles she is uh, uh, rung up on the, on the uh, airlines. I mean, she's across the country all the time, and uh, uh, I'm sure that's a bit tiresome, but she does it with an incredibly good spirit uh, and obviously is very in, uh, intent in what she does. She obtained her medical degree from the University of Maryland School of Medicine and did her pediatric residency at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. She has appeared uh, on Bill Moyer's journal, The Ed Schultz Show, and many other venues. Uh, and I think most remarkable, she is now is doing this uh, with three teenagers. Having had three teenagers once, they're both a joy and a challenge, and so I really admire her for that. Uh, uh, so Dr. Flowers, welcome, and thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm um, so pleased that you invited me to be here with you tonight. Um, it's wonderful to meet the people here in Washington. It's my first time to Seattle, so it's been a real treat for me. And to be here and, and share this event tonight with my brother and sister in the Bacchus 8, uh, Katie Robbins and Mark Dudzik. Um, I wanted to share a little something with you because I have a dear friend, Dr. Carol Paris, who is also one of the Bacchus 8 members, who's a practicing psychiatrist in uh, Maryland. And um, Carol first brought this to my attention, that we have a very serious condition that's developing in this country. And she was able to put a name to it, fortunately, and um, has even developed the diagnostic criteria, which were published last month. And this, um, this condition is called PIST. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> P-I-I-S-D. Um, it stands for Private Insurance Induced Stress Disorder. Anybody here suffer from PIST? <laughs> yeah. It was interesting because when she wrote the criteria and Psychiatric Times published it on their blog online, um, they got so many responses to it that they contacted her and said, now we'd like to publish it in our print edition, and that's where it got in last month. So this is definitely something that's, that's ringing a bell with people. I see it everywhere that I go. It doesn't affect just patients. It affects our uh, health professionals as well um, as we try to provide quality care in this environment. So um, what are we dealing with right now? Uh, and why did I leave practice and, and devote my you know, time to this like many of you have done? Why do we do this? We have a very serious problem in this country. We have health care costs that are rising out of control, rising faster than our GDP, hurting our businesses, hurting our entire national economy. We have a growing number of un uninsured people. In 2009, the census data showed the greatest jump since we've been keeping this data in the number of newly uninsured. And these are affecting families, working families, and then, of course, the families that have lost their job in this economic downturn. We have a growing number of underinsured people. What are underinsured people? These are people that pay insurance premiums, but they have such high copays and deductibles and uncovered services that they're unprotected in their time of illness, and they go bankrupt, the leading cause of bankruptcy in our nation. This is a very serious problem. It's not going away. It's getting worse, and the new legislation that passed fails to address these problems adequately. And so it was, um, I guess, heartening to see that once the reform passed, and even the president was honest enough at the end that he said this was health insurance reform, we were hoping for health care reform, um, that people got that, that we realized that we're not done yet. And so it's been my schedule, which I thought after the reform passed, I might get a break. Um, I'm really glad that I didn't get a break, because what that meant is that people were still ready to keep working. And, and I'm glad that you guys are here tonight. It's so important. We were hoping um, during the reform process, due to the seriousness of what's going on in this country, that we would actually have a real debate. We didn't get that real debate. We were hoping that we would have a conversation about what actually works, what would really address the fundamental problems. Why didn't that happen? 
I think that, like many other issues that are, that are of concern in our country right now, this was a, a process, this health reform process, illustrated very clearly the corporate control of our political process and the corporate control of our media with the misinformation that goes out about what real health reform is and what it looks like. Um, so, as I've said, this, this health reform is inadequate. It's just a continuing, for me, um, being in Congress, um, being so close to what was going on was very reminiscent of what I had been experiencing in my state legislature in Maryland, and probably many of you experienced this as well. Every year, some health reform legislation would get introduced. And I would actually go down there and I would say, well, you know, I'm glad to see that you're expanding Medicaid. That's important. But I want you to realize that we've been expanding Medicaid in the state of Maryland for all of these years, and yet our uninsured numbers continue to rise. And I'm hoping that at some point you're going to realize that this is not the solution and you're going to adopt real health reform. And, and I see, I saw good people at the state level um, and again at the national level who believe in health reform, who understand the seriousness of the crisis, but as Mark said, we accept what they give us. They say, well, we'll give you this expansion, we'll give you this tax credit, we'll give you this subsidy, and it's such a serious situation that's going on, how can you turn that down? You can't turn that down, and so we accept it. And meanwhile, as we've been accepting these patches to what's going on in our country, in good faith because we want to do something, we've not been gaining ground. Our health care costs have continued to rise out of control. Our uninsured have continued to grow. Our underinsured have continued to grow. Our health outcomes continue to be poor. So at some point, we have to say to ourselves, when do you stop accepting these small changes and when do you really mount the fight that we're going to have to mount if we want to get he real health reform in this country? And that's what I brought into the, the process in 2009 was I thought, that we were at that point <laughs> where we were going to have this real debate. And um, as many of you know, uh, we worked very hard through a coalition with Mark and Katie and, and a lot of other groups, labor and faith groups. We worked early in the reform process to try to, to request that our voices be heard, that they consider uh, single payer reform alongside what they were putting together, and that didn't happen. When it came to the committee, as many of you know, we were completely excluded. And at that point, we had to say to ourselves, what do we do? Do we just admit defeat? Um, this was unacceptable to us. And so we did go down to the Senate Finance Committee and we did stand up and say, why aren't you including single payer? And the C-SPAN cameras were rolling and the press was there and we didn't know whether it would have, make a difference or not, but, um, but we were able to expose what was going on. And to me, this is what it, it kind of boils down to is, is, what are we willing to do? When are we willing to say that the crisis is severe enough that what we've been trying hasn't worked over and over and over again, that despite the fact that we're told that this is not politically feasible, um, when are we going to say that, that we're, gonna, we're ready to do the hard work? As Jim McDermott said, you know, I look to you guys to do the hard work to make us do it, basically, was what he was telling us to do. And, um, and for me, that time is now. Um, yeah. <laughs> Over and over throughout history, movements, social movements have been told they were asking for too much. Um, the women that wanted the right to vote were told they were asking for too much. Um, during the Civil Rights Movement, we were told that we were asking for too much. But the only reason that we made those gains is because we didn't accept that. We said, no, we're not asking for too much. This is what we require, and, and we, we fought. I mean, people... Um, I've been reading uh, an excellent book about the students that got involved in SNCC back in the 1950s and 60s. The tremendous sacrifices that they made are so touching to me. Um, family didn't want them to do what they did. They gave up college careers. They stayed in jail for weeks. Many of them were beaten, um, injured. They went through that. Um, that was the degree of sacrifice that they were ready to make. And, and so I think that what I'm saying is that while things that we do, like the advocacy work, is important, I don't think that that alone is going to create the real change that we need. It's going to take a lot more from us than we've previously been giving. Um, some of the things that I learned during that reform process I wanted to share with you. And um, 
It falls under the initials ICU, which I think is kind of telling. ICU standing for intensive care unit, and you can think we're in a crisis. Um, one of the things is we have to remember is that we're a movement. We're a movement for health reform change, and a movement is different from a political party. It's imperative that a movement be independent from a political party. Now, I'm, I'm not saying... <laughs> I'm not saying don't vote, I'm not saying don't work for candidates or elect people that support single payer, but what I'm saying is that when it comes down to it, politicians are politicians, and they're never going to be anything different from politicians, okay? <laughs> and our role is to hold them accountable and to push them and make them do what it is that, that we require of them to do. Um, so we must be independent and, and realize that our agenda comes first. We have to be very clear. We have to be... We have to be incredibly clear on what it is that does and does not work. Um, during the reform process, it was really interesting if you stood back and kind of look at, looked at what happened, and, and this is kind of my read on what happened um, with the public option. We had a population of people in this country, the majority, that support health reform, that want to see change. We had uh, this corporate control over our, you know, our politicians, our political process, saying what they wanted to get done. And I, they didn't really want single payer in there causing trouble, right? So what do you do when you've got a majority of people that want reform and the majority of those people want a single payer national health system? You need to inject something in there to divide them. And that was the public option. That was a well-financed campaign that took those who support reform and it caused us to be fighting amongst ourselves over which was better. Should we fight for single payers? Should we fight for a public option? And it worked incredibly well. So this is important that we have to be clear and unified, as Mark said, in what it is that we're fighting for. We're fighting for a real solution, a national single payer, a state single payer system. And the third thing is that we have to be uncompromising. Um, if you look at what in this nation we have settled for in terms of a social infrastructure compared to what they have in other nations, we have a very weak social infrastructure. Um, one of my favorite articles is called The American Dream is Alive and Well in Finland. <laughs> so, because they have the social infrastructure that actually allows their people to advance and have upward mobility, something that we don't have here in this country. So um, we've got to learn to be uncompromising. You know, th there was a lot of talk um, during the reform process about Cadillac health insurance plans, but a Cadillac health insurance plan is probably what we called an adequate health insurance plan a few decades ago. Um, there's, uh, well, I don't want to get on. Okay. All right. So, um, so it's important. We need to be independent. We need to be clear. We need to be uncompromising in our demands. I was going to say the other was um, my nephew, 39 years old. I thought he knew better. I was visiting, visiting him in Los Angeles last week, and he said, oh, Mark reminded me of this. Those teachers in California, we're paying them too much, and we're giving them too much in their pension plans, and they're not, you know, the, the private sector is falling below, and, and, you know, we've got to cut their pensions and their salaries to be more in line. Well, that's probably what we consider to be adequate pay and adequate benefits, you know, in this nation, but things have slid down so much. So we've got to remember what our definition used to be of, of what was acceptable and how little we've been willing to accept as we've slid backwards since that time. All right, so what are some opportunities that we have? I think that it's very exciting what's happening at the state level. There are now 20 or more states that are working single-payer bills in some stage. And we are excited about what's happening in Vermont. We're still um, looking to see what that legislation is going to look like. But when you talk about political feasibility, let's talk about what happened in Vermont. So they had a Democratic primary for their governor, and each of the candidates was fighting to show which one of them was the strongest single-payer supporter. <laughs> And it was Governor Shumlin, the one who ran on the strongest single-payer platform, that won. Now, Senator Sanders has been a longtime single-payer supporter, and Peter Welch, their congressman, has been an H.R. 676 co-sponsor. But guess who else is suddenly a single-payer supporter? Senator Leahy, so, <laughs> who never went on record before supporting this. So suddenly, political feasibility has changed significantly in the state of Vermont, and that's what happens. Political feasibility is something that happens based on the political mood or what the people are, are demanding. But let's set that apart between what's practical feasibility, because we're told over and over that single-payer is not politically feasible, but we know that it's not 
that anything less than that is not practically feasible. It just simply won't work. So um, we've got to keep that in mind as we move forward. So at the state level, I think it's fantastic that you have a bill here in, in your state. And I understand from what I've been hearing over the last couple of days is that you've been hearing that this is not the time to push that. Is that what I'm hearing from you guys? That that there's some serious state budget deficits going on and, and that that's what the legislature's caught up with. Well, guess what? There is never going to be the perfect time for a state single payer bill. We saw this, I see this regularly in the state of Maryland. The last two years we were told, oh, well, this isn't the time because federal reform is on the table and we want to see what they pass. And now that that has passed and we're working our bill, I've had wonderful teams fortunately back home in my absence working the bill, they're telling me that they're hearing that, well, now that federal health reform is passed, this is not the time for single payer because we're too busy figuring out what we need to do to make this federal reform work. And it's, it's, that's just not going to go away. You know, it's, it's, um, there's always going to be an excuse of why now is not the time for single payer. So I would say that in this time of a serious state budget deficit, where you know that your Medicaid benefits are going to have to get cut, and that's going to leave real people without care, where you know that health care benefits for your public employees are under attack, where we know that having a single payer system at the state level is going to solve those problems and help your state budget deficit, this is absolutely the time for you to be out there making this case, even if you don't win. You need to be in there letting them know that this is not going away, that this is a solution, that you're going to keep pushing it. So I encourage you to work at the state level um, to get active and, and, and not accept those excuses that they're giving you. At the national level, we also have a tremendous opportunity um, because, as Mark told you, this legislation that passed is already starting to unravel. What it's actually unraveling faster than we, when, than we thought it would. Um, what's interesting is that you may not be aware that over the last year since it passed, they've issued over 300 waivers exempting people from provisions, exempting businesses and insurance companies from provisions in the legislation. The Department of Health and Human Services actually has a 24-hour turnaround time now on waivers exempting, uh, exempting groups from the legislation. And I think for me as a, as a pediatrician, one of the most striking things that, that occurred during this last year was that at the six-month anniversary of the legislation, there were certain provisions that kicked in. And one of those was that insurance companies could no longer deny new policies to children because of pre-existing conditions. Well, guess what happened the day before that provision kicked in? A number of large insurance companies around the country stated that they were no longer going to be offering new policies to children. <laughs> this is such a clear example of what's happening in this country. Health insurance is a product. It's a product that's developed and marketed, it's put on a shelf to make a profit. And when that product is no longer profitable, there is no reason for an insurance company to continue to offer that product. And that's what market-based health care is all about. And what happened in that situation was they got waivers. Um, so now maybe some children will still be able to get health insurance um, individual policies. Um, in addition to those waivers, we're seeing the constitutional attack. And, um, and that's really interesting. The decision that came out this, this week um, was a Florida judge. There were actually two issues that were being under um, consideration in that case. One was whether states were um, required under this bill to contribute to the expansion of Medicaid, a public program. And this very conservative judge ruled that yes, States could be required to pay into Medicaid. It's a public program, and you're taxing for the general welfare of the, of the people. That's constitutional. He also decided that in, in terms of the legislation, the individual mandate that you purchase private insurance, that that was not constitutional. So we know that a Medicare for All system is <laughs> constitutional, <laughs> and it's been said by you know, a very conservative judge. So that's, that's a good thing. But that's another attack that's, that's happening on the legislation. And then finally, as Mark said, the death by a thousand cuts. Um, we've seen already what the... Um, Republican agenda is if you look at some of the conservative think tanks like the Heritage Foundation, they lay out very clearly there what they want to do and they want to move us in a direction of further market, you know, creating, privatizing and, and 
making a, a market-based uh, commodity, healthcare as a commodity, and, um, and they're going to do that by obstructing and, and defunding portions of the bill. And that's going to be really harmful. Um, and it's going to be difficult to, to shift that around. The more that we empower this private insurance-based uh, thing that we have here, um, and then the third thing is the national deficit um, and what they're blaming the deficit on, which is Medicare and Medicaid. And this is ridiculous because um, if you look at, and we we try to make this case, if you look at the the rise in the cost of Medicare and Medicaid, it's a lower slope. It's a slower rise than our than our, the rise in the private part of our health care. Um, so what we've tried to argue to them in, in is that Medicare and Medicaid are not the cause of our deficit. They're the, they're the victims of a broken health situation where costs are already rising out of control. And the best way to fix them is to get that under control by having a, a national improved Medicare for all health system. Um, so these are, these are opportunities that we can use to continue to make our argument and to continue to push. And what's going to happen is that as things fall apart, health reform at the national level is going to be on the table again. And guess who's going to be the ones that, that are there, that win? The ones who are present, the ones who are there, the ones who are organized, the ones who have the solution. And so we have a lot of work to do over these next few years to get ready for that at the national level as well. And you can use your state work to help you do that. So the key things that we need to focus on right now, we need to focus on education. Education is something that every single person in this room can do. Either you can learn how to speak about single payer, um, and I encourage you to organize you know, speaker trainings if you're not already doing that. Um, you can, if you can't, don't feel comfortable speaking about single payer, every single one of you in this room has a family member, has coworkers, has friends, has some sort of group that you belong to, organize an event at your group, at your church, at your union hall, at your community group, at your school. Invite some of the speakers that you have here in Washington to come and speak because education is really critical. There's a tremendous amount of misinformation out there, but um, what I found going around and speaking to groups that don't understand what single payer is, is that once they understand what it is, <laughs> They get it, and it doesn't matter what their kind of political ideology is. I've been really surprised at some of the grand rounds I've given in hospitals where we have no PNHP members and which are in fairly conservative districts. And those doctors really do want to take care of their patients also. And when they're presented with the data, they do really get it. And, and the same thing with um, you know, business. I, I just don't be afraid to talk to anybody about it. Um, so education is key because we've got to be ready to counter the misinformation that's going to be coming down the line. Um, and then the other piece is organization. Because how do we switch this corporate control of our political process? Corporations have a lot of money and they're able to support campaigns, they're able to hire lobbyists, but they don't have votes like we have. We're, that's our power. We have the power of the vote. And, uh, and if you walk into a Congress member's office and you have thousands of voters in that district that say that they will only vote if you do these things for single payer, that's a tremendous amount of power that you have. And so we have to build to that point so that the next time that health care reform comes up at the national level, that we're ready to march in there, that we're ready to make the phone calls, send the emails, send the letters, get down there to those offices, let them know that we want a single payer national health system. So education and organization are key priorities coming up, and you can use your state bill to help you in those efforts as well. Um, so what's our goal? Um, our goal in this country, and I think Mark alluded to this some as well, is to create a healthy society, right? And um, health is partially determined by our access to health care. About 10% of our health is determined by access to, to medical care. So that's an important piece. But the rest of it is what are called social determinants of health. And these are things like education, um, having a home that you live in, in an a environment that's free of violence, it's having a job with an, a living wage, it's being treated with dignity, it's having a clean environment, clean water, access to affordable food. So what health, the movement for healthcare really is, is it's just one piece in this broader movement for social and econ economic justice. And we're at a time in our country um, that our wealth inequality 
Many of you are probably aware of this. Our wealth inequality is growing. It's wider than it was even prior to the Depression back in the 1930s. And so um, we're coming upon a time that, that is going to be increasingly difficult. It's already difficult, and it's going to be more difficult. And it's important that, um, that we work together on this kind of broad-based agenda for social and economic justice, for peace. How many of you work on different issues? Are there people here that have done actions for peace, for education, for housing, for jobs, <laughs> you know, for all these things? We've got to come get together and realize that our strength is in numbers and that really it is a common agenda that we're all fighting for here. So I um, just want to leave you with a few thoughts. Um, as a Don said, I'm a, you know, I'm a pediatrician, I'm a mother with three kids, and um, really never anticipated that I was going to be doing the things that I did. Um, like you, just a person that cared about what's happening in our country. And so every single one of you has some way that you can contribute to what we're doing here. And every single one of you has a talent. And so I encourage you to find something that you're good at. Are you good at making phone calls and talking to people? Are you good at doing you know, data input into a computer? Are you good at designing web pages? You know, are you good at getting out there and tabling? What do you feel comfortable with? Find some way, because we need all of us. This is really the time. This crisis is not going away. We need all of us to be in here doing something. So find out what it is that you enjoy doing, what you're good at, get hooked in, and get working, and, uh, and let's make this happen. So thanks very much. <laughs>